Dear Adil Najam, dear Mike Bonanno, dear Stefan Ramsdorf, dear Andrew Refkins, dear artists, journalists, and researchers whom we have the honor to welcome today and tomorrow in our symposium about climate change, the arts, and the media. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Detlef Gericke Schönhagen. I'm the director of the Goethe Institute Boston. Since several months, we are reading the web pages and blogs and articles of our invitees, and we are contemplating their artworks, their media installations, cartoons and environmental campaigns, and we are honored that they came here to be part of the symposium. Thank you very much. Let me quote some of the reflections which I found in the articles and blogs and that I keep in my memory. This summer has been one of weather-related extremes in Russia, Pakistan, China, Europe, and the Arctic. For weeks, central Russia has been in the grips of its worst ever heat wave, which has caused probably thousands of fatalities. Meanwhile, Pakistan is struggling with unprecedented flooding that has killed more than a thousand people and affected millions more. In China, flash floods have so far killed more than a thousand people and destroyed more than a million homes. On a smaller scale, European countries like Germany, Poland, and the Czech Republic have also suffered serious flooding, floodings. Global temperatures in recent months have been at their highest levels in records that go back 130 years. Arctic sea ice cover reached its lowest recorded average level for the months of June ever. We must face the facts. Our emissions of greenhouse gases probably are at least partly to blame for this summer of extremes. But the whole decade has been marked by a number of stunning extremes. In 2003, the most severe heat wave in living memory in Europe. In 2005, the most severe hurricane seasons have witnessed in the Atlantic devastated New Orleans. In 2007, unprecedented wildfires raged across Greece, nearly destroying the ancient site of Olympia. And the Northwest Passage in the Arctic became ice-free for the first time in living memory. Owing to fossil fuel emissions, there is now one-third more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than at any time in at least a million years, as the latest ice drilling in Antarctica has revealed. The causes and effects of climate change are the subject of numerous seminars, studies, and conferences, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change meeting that finished last Thursday in Busan, uh, Republic of Korea. However, what brings us here together is of a different nature. No one escapes that climate change is no longer an issue owned by scientists. Climate change is a political, economical, and social cultural issue. And public perception is key to those three. But who shapes public perception? In particular, what is the role of the media and the arts in framing public perception? These are the questions we want to address with this event. We'll have a particular look on transatlantic differences in perceiving and dealing with a problem and what one side might learn from the other. Thank you to Bernd Sommer, who is a research fellow at the KVE the Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities in Essen, and who spent four weeks in Boston this year to develop, together with my colleague, Annette Klein, a convincing concept for this symposium, its main structure, and its main lecturers. Thank you to the Party Center for the study of the lower range future, in particular, Professor Adil Najam and Mikael Munoz, who were wonderful partners in conceptualizing the basic ideas for the symposium, who are moderating the panels, and who are our hosts. Thank you, the colleagues Alain, Elain, and Therese from the Frederick S. Party Center for the study of the longer range future, and to our intern Marlene from the Goethe Institute, who helped with the logistic and communication of the seminar. 
Tonight's discussion will be followed by two panels tomorrow morning at 8.30, and a guided tour by Simon Faithful, the artist Simon Faithful, through the media art exhibition Control Issues tomorrow at 6 p.m. in the Boston Center for the Arts. Thank you for listening, and please enjoy the discussion, which is going to start now. Thank you, Gerhard, for that wonderful, wonderful uh, opening and, and introduction. Thank you very much for, for uh, to Goethe Institute and to you personally for uh, for for uh, hosting this event and for partnering with the Boston University Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. It's been a wonderful partnership, and we are looking forward, like all of you, to 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 uh, today and tomorrow, uh, wonderful uh, conversations. Uh, my name is Adil Najim. I am the director of the Frederick S. Party Center for the Study of the longer range future and and this this particular event i personally have been looking forward to for 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 ever since it was conceived uh, maybe i should say of how it was conceived uh, burn myself and miguel were coming back driving back from new york after a particularly stimulating un meeting uh, there is no such thing as a particularly stimulating UN meeting. Uh, and this was, we were coming back after the uh, meeting of the Commission on Sustainable Development, and we were thinking about what to do. And we came up with all sorts of ideas of the type of academic meetings that all of us have, have been in too many times. And then we thought maybe we should talk instead about the things that really matter much more. Uh, and may really think about how here were two Europeans and a Pakistani traveling from New York to Boston. Uh, and maybe the thing to talk about was how are these public perceptions around the world created of this issue of climate change, which is so central uh, to our global conversation. And it is quite clear that those perceptions are very different in Europe uh, and the US. We've been to many, many, many conferences which talk about what those differences are. But here we wanted to put our, put our fingers on the pulse of why they may, might be different. And more than that, to put our fingers on the pulse of the larger question of how are public perceptions of issues such as climate change, issues that are considered to be issues of science, but are really issues not just of, of, of public policy, but of public opinion. Uh, how are they conceived? How are they constructed? How are they deconstructed? And what happens in that arena of public debate? And in that arena of public debate, much more important uh, than just the scientists, or certainly, uh, certainly uh, there with them, are journalists, the media, and those in the world of the arts. So that is sort of the genesis of where we came up with this notion that maybe having a conversation uh, around transatlantic lines, where we get some friends, uh, colleagues, journalists, artists, and others from Europe, uh, and some from the US, and others like myself who are sort of eavesdropping on both, both continents, to think about how are we constructing this public image uh, of 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 this this issue and and where might that go? Uh, so that is the idea of the conversation today and tomorrow. We will have this opening panel, and I am delighted to have uh, three wonderful uh, wonderful uh, and eminent presenters with me. And then tomorrow we'll have two more uh, panels in 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 the morning. Uh, in this panel, we have uh, we will start with a view from the world of the media, uh, a view from journalism, and I am delighted to have with me Andy Refkin, who I've known for some, some, some time, mostly over email. Uh, and I had been hoping he would bring his guitar, and, and I do not joke, look him up on YouTube. Uh, that's how you find the real, real sense of anyone these days, by looking them up on, on, on YouTube. Uh, he, he used to be uh, the uh, climate reporter for the New York Times. He still writes the very, very popular and largely read and very influential blog, Dot Earth, uh, for New York Times, but maybe much more important 
at least for me in his CV was that in his spare moments he is a performing songwriter and multi instrumentalist. You you need to tell me what instruments those are. Uh, who occasionally accompanies uh, Pete Seeger. Uh, so you know, New York, New York Times can come and go, but Pete Seeger is Pete <laughs> Seeger. So we have to have our priorities right. So we are delighted to have Andy Revkin who will who will start us off. Uh, our second uh, presenter is someone uh, who who. Uh, uh, I, I do not know how to describe, <laughs> but maybe he will help us. Uh, he will help us describe uh, himself. He is a scholar, a academic. He is a performing artist. He is an activist. He's a filmmaker. Uh, but most importantly, I think he is someone who speaks with his conscience through his work. Uh, part of the group Yes Men, and I will leave it to him to tell you more about it, Mike Bonanno, uh, who's here with us and will be talking about his work. Uh, the, what I should tell you about him is that this Friday uh, evening when I was going back home at 6.30, there's a show on NPR called Market uh, something. Place. Marketplace. Marketplace. And I was, I was driving back, and there he is on the on the radio being interviewed. Uh, and um, the last question the interviewer asked him was, are you planning something big? And Mike's answer was, we will change the world in the next two or three days. Uh, today is day three. <laughs> so, so there is an expectation here uh, of, of, of changing the world. Maybe I've set that up a bit too much. Our third speaker this uh, evening is going to be uh, Stephen Ramstroff, who is with us uh, from Germany, one of the leading climate scientists of our time, especially uh, in terms of issues related to the global oceans. Uh, now uh, he is currently, he's, he's, he's worked as a scientist in, at the New Zealand Oceanographic uh, Institute uh, at the Marine Sciences, Institute of Marine Sciences in Kiel, and he is now at the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. Uh, he was one of the lead authors of the fourth uh, IPCC uh, climate um, assessment report and a major figure in the science uh, of climate. So we have three voices here, one from the world of media, one from the world of the arts, very broadly put, and one uh, from the world of academia. And all three voices, I think, cross over to some of these other worlds, and that's what makes them interesting. So without further ado, let me ask Andy to start us off uh, on, 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 on today's discussion. Andy. <coughs> It's uh, great to be here. It's great to be on a panel with a yes with a yes man. I've written about your survival ball, survival ah, ball. I don't yes. know if you show them that later, <laughs> and and also the fake New York Post thing, or was it real? I don't know. We'll we'll never know. Mm. Um, we're we're in a realm with this issue, this climate question, and the energy question that underlies it, uh, where all voices matter. Uh, it used to be perceived as a science question, but of course, in any arena, science just sets the boundaries. In fact, science is kind of like, if you ever channel surf and catch one of those cage fights <laughs> it, where the guys are tearing each other's ears off and stuff, science is basically the cage. It tells you the scenarios, the outcomes that might happen depending on what happens in the, in the physical world and the biological world, and then the rest of us have to hash out what you do about that. And the intensity that has uh, built on something like climate in recent years is simply a function that push is coming to shove. I've been covering global warming since before there was an IPCC, before there was a UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, back in the calm days of the late 80s when it was just a news story. Without, but there wasn't yet the uh, momentousness. The world wasn't actually trading carbon as it is now. And, and so the, the stakes are arisen, everybody is agitated. And at the same time, my own, in my own reporting, I started out for the first 15 years of writing about the human influence on the climate system and the climate influence on the human system. Uh, it was mostly about the biogeophysical stuff. And then the last five or six or seven years, I started dipping into the social science, you know, why we, how we perceive facts, how we filter facts based on predispositions, how we don't act on the basis of certain kinds of risks, whether it's a financial uh, warning or a climatological one. And that, that, that has become by far the most depressing uh, data that I have had the displeasure of looking at. It's not, not the glacier melting or you know, species extinction. It's like how, the, as I wrote on a Dot Earth post a year or two ago, um, the, the climate problem in here is the climate problem in our heads. And I don't mean that we're making it up. I mean, but the problem is that we can't perceive this. Uh, I just did a piece a week or two ago on Dot Earth about um, 
asking the question, the kind of brutal question, is there anything that actually distinguishes us from bacteria on a plate of agar in a petri dish? In other words, you, put, you, you inoculate that plate and the bacteria start growing. And theoretically, scientists are there. As, as the IPCC, this is when they were unfolding the last IPCC report in 2007. The scientists are there to tell us, hey, there's the edge of the petri dish. It's out there. It's coming. It's coming closer. We, you can't just keep eating agar. You can't just sort of keep filling the atmosphere uh, with this stuff. And, and we're like, um, this was a scene from Rebel Without a Cause. Anyone, you know, the, the great movie from 1950s where the father is admonishing the son, you know, son, if you keep driving too fast and drinking too much and hanging out with these terrible people, you're going to die. And the son, you know, is in there fighting that information. And, and to me, uh, I feel like we're at this point where the scientists are like the father chiding the, the wayward teenager. And, and, and this, so again, this leads me back to the question of, is the problem more here than out there in the physical and, and biological world? And two or three years ago, it was actually a German commentator on my blog wrote in his comment, um, our, blah, 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 bang. <laughs> and, and as a result, I wrote a post called, are we stuck with blah, 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 bang? And for the moment, the answer, the question still hovers out there. And I, I, I don't see encouraging signs that we can surmount these impe impediments to communicating this issue, and not just communicating, but integrating the issue into the way we make decisions in our daily lives and our political lives. Um, and that's why experimentation is vital. That's why people like Yes Men are vital. Now, the other side has their, their creative, innovative pe people in the uh, media realm as well. And we, if we're not f rigorously um, considering the science of psychology and sociology and how we look at these bigger questions, we're going to the chances of overwhelming the agar plate or, or having the bang at the end of the sentence are fairly high. I want to quickly go back to that opening slide and just explain, you know, I spent also most of my professional life, more than 25 years as a journalist, typing. And I, I did a lot of photography. I've worked on a documentary uh, on the Arctic that came out in 2005. And, and on the blog, I shoot my own video. But mostly it's been words, you know, a couple million words, a book, a book in 1992 on global warming, a book in 2006 on the changing Arctic, uh, a book on the loss of the Amazon in 1990, and then all this stuff in between, magazines, articles, and stuff. But then I, you know, in just this past year, I stumbled on Adam Neiman's work. He's from the other side of the Atlantic, a British science illustrator who did this image, which essentially, uh, the one on the left, he did a careful um, analysis. If you took all the world's liquid water, the oceans, lakes, rivers, and you put that volume in a sphere, what, how big would that be? And that's, that's it. So to me, all that typing and typing and typing isn't actually conveying as much inf meaning to me as an image like this, which says if we're talking about the destruction of ocean fisheries or the acidification of sea, the, the seas, a good starting point is to remind ourselves just what a small volume we're talking about. The pink bubble on the other side is the, uh, all the world's atmosphere. Now, you've, I'm sure you saw, many of you saw Al Gore's movie where he talked about being like the varnish on a, on a globe or something. I don't know. For some reason, this gets to me better. It, it, and this is, um, if all the air in the atmosphere were at sea level temp uh, pressure, how big would it be? And again, so that's, as we head from seven toward nine billion people, that's it. You know? So we, that's the commons that we're negotiating about. And I think it helps. I'm hoping that there's ways to take data, which as David Ropeek, who lives here in, in Boston, wrote a book recently on risk perception. He, he's actually a good student of risk perception and, and action. Um, he says, you know, facts are like meaningless stones in the road. They don't really matter until they pass through the filter of perception and affect and, and predisposition. And to me, so he said what matters is affect, emotional response if you want to get someone's attention in a lasting way, you have to kind of get through those filters. And a good starting place, I think, is to see if there's ways to have good old-fashioned data, but also have a broader meaning. And I think, again, this image kind of does that. I'm going to skip through a lot of things in my, I'm going to make this as brief as possible. One of the other fundamental realities is climate, the, 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 those wonderful, way back in the, the 20th century, we had it so easy because environmental problems were all palpable, tangible, for the most part, in your face. Uh, this, this was smog. You know, you could smell it, taste it. 
Um, and, and carbon dioxide, of course, is not like that. I, I did a piece on Dot Earth recently say, raising the, posing the question, what if CO2 were pink? And use this image. Would we, as the atmosphere got more pink <laughs> over time, would we start to say, hey, you know, some, something's going on here. We, we really do need to pay attention. Of course, it's not pink. And uh, by the way, the sociologists will tell you something very depressing about things like the pinkification of the atmosphere, which is that incremental change be is basically imperceptible. Each, each generation is born with a pinker atmosphere and doesn't realize very much that it was different in the old days. Uh, the books on my shelf about the Arctic that were my dad's were about this frozen wasteland that people will never be, you know, everyone who went there died, all the white guys who went up there. And, and the Arctic of my son's time is portrayed in books like The North Pole Was Here, my book about Arctic change, as they grow up with the norm that, you know, the Arctic's changing and there's ships now moving around up there and there's less sea ice and polar bears are having a hard time. But that's now their new normal. So I'd like to think that, you know, if you could do thought experiments like this, it could make a difference. But then I get challenged to think, well, maybe because of those limits in our own uh, understanding that that's not possible either. And now here comes the fast forward part. Now again, this is not a new problem. The New York Times, a wonderful article delineating every aspect of the climate problem appeared in 1956, the year of my birth. It was focused on the work of a, a, a physicist named Gilbert Plass, who I'm sure Stefan knows about. And uh, it basically had it all kind of worked out. That, and, and this, you know, you can go way back to the 1890s, but this was the piece that really kind of nailed the, the issue. And it ends with a statement that is as relevant today as it was in the year of my birth. Coal and oil are still plentiful and cheap in many parts of the world, and there's every reason to believe that both will be consumed by industry so long as it pays to do so. In other words, as long as there's no cost on emitting these gases, we're just going to keep pumping them out because we have the, 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 the near-term benefit. And you know, basically every story I've written and anyone else has written on global warming since then has taken that same architecture. And uh, another data point that's worth looking at is the, the great Supreme Court deliberation in the United States in 2006 when the uh, Massachusetts Attorney General or someone, the lawyer from the office here, uh, in this debate over CO2, should it be a pollutant like that old smoggy stuff, um, he was clarifying this issue with this stuff in, in the atmosphere. And he said, uh, oh, no, respectfully, Your Honor, it's not the stratosphere, it's the troposphere. And Justice Scalia said, troposphere, whatever. I, I told you before, I'm not a scientist. Laughter, we need a laugh track. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I don't want to have to deal with global warming to tell you the truth. <laughs> so now, and everyone would say, oh, he's just that arch conservative Supreme Court justice. But there's a big chunk of all of us who just doesn't want to deal with global warming. And that, again, if we don't confront that carefully, and if those who are pushing for action don't just simply think if they just push harder or make it seem that much more dire or uh, whatever, if, that they can just get through those filters. It's just not that simple. And I'm going to fast forward because the best part will be when we're just chattering. Um, and there's been, well, you know what, there's been plenty of stories, many of which I wrote through the 2000s about political interference with information, disinformers. Uh, there's some were in the White House. Some were trying to muzzle people like Jim Hansen into not speaking out about the risks of global warming. Uh, they were editing stuff. Government documents were being edited by a former oil lobbyist who worked in the White House under the Bush administration, doing his little scribbles, taking out the phrase um, warmer. Uh, it's actually quite, it's quite remarkable. He took out the phrase, warming will also cause reductions in mountain glaciers as too speculative. That's like saying, you know, open the door of your refrigerator, the food's going to spoil. Where, where's the speculation? But he wouldn't even allow that in the document. So there's been a lot of that stuff. And some people think that if we magically just make information perfect without these uh, evildoers, that suddenly people will get engaged. But again, the, the evidence is not so simple. And on the other side, again, and sometimes within the scientific community and even within organizations, like in this case, the National Science Foundation in 2008, uh, put out a press release, climate change drives widespread amphibian extinctions, period. And many of the news articles had picked up on this phenomenon. This was about Costa Rican uh, amphibian losses um, that one study had linked to human-driven climate change. And that is a heavy lift to take a regional impact on species and say this, there is a link to this human forcing on the global climate system is a very tough thing to do. And of course, many people disputed that. And so, so one thing that you have 
in the, in the United States frequent, frequently is what I call whiplash journalism and whiplash science and whiplash press releases where, where, where because we're all attuned to the new and the different and the dangerous and the, and, and the interesting, some papers said, oh, you know, it's, it's happening. Frogs are being extinguished by human-driven global warming. And then that just gives an opening, because it is an implicit overstatement even of what was in that paper, to um, naysayers, stasists as I call them, to come in and say, ah, oh, see, they're overstating the facts. And you end up with this kind of reverberation that is very poisonous in the long run. And I think that that's what we've seen in the last few years was a little bit of that kind of reverberation. There were, there were people, it's been portrayed as a catastrophe versus hoax issue. And what happens, what gets lost and lost in all of that is the reality, that there's a bunch of science that is not in dispute. And we're heading toward the edge of this Petri dish. And it's kind of unfortunate. So everyone gets kind of in the game. And I, 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 won't, I won't play it right now because I want to keep this streamlined. But some campaigners get really carried away. Uh, there was this video, I don't know if anyone saw it, that um, on YouTube called No Pressure by the British group 1010 trying to get everybody to cut emissions of CO2 in rich places 10% a year um, and for 10 years or something like that. And, and they put out a video that was incredibly captivating. It shows kids in a room. I don't know who came up with the concept. And, and the teacher's telling them, hey, we could all do this 10-10 thing. And, and she says, anyone uh, against it? And a couple of kids kind of say no. And then she, she makes them blow up. And they, the, the whole room is splattered with their guts and brains. And, and of course, it was very viral. But, and, and so if your goal was to get attention, they did it. But if your goal was to actually get people to sign on to this movement and to get attention that would actually matter for energy choices and stuff, I don't think it worked. So, so we're still, for the moment, stuck in this kind of reverberation effort. And, and again, quickly, I'll summarize. The media, of course, at the same time this is happening, the media are going through this epic change. Back in, way back in the 20th century, when pollution was so clear, there was also this clarity in the message. We had a, a guy named Walter Cronkite and others like him who just every evening you'd be having your dinner at home like we, when we were when I was a kid. And he, his sign off was, that's the way it is. Don't, no worries, no complexity. You know, we're just telling you the way the world is. And there was, it was like everyone in America was dining on mac macaroni and cheese, comfort food we call it. And it was, so it was like this communal intellectual comfort food. And now, now instead of that, you have this insane buffet where anyone can come on any night and get the information that's still comfort food for them. So if I'm a libertarian, I can go, you know, I, a naysayer on climate, I can go to what's up with that. If I'm an absolute believer and a liberal, and I can go to climate progress. And, and so we're fracturing in ways where everyone is now feeling comfortable in his or her own little universe. And that is not going to change, spark an energy revolution like the one that would be needed if you want to limit climate risk. So in all of that, you know, we're all stuck with experimentation. Um, there are some experiments that involve, again, and the media are shrinking. There, there aren't, the, Walter Cronkite types are still there, but the New York Times, you know, I, I left the paper last year um, Cornelia Dean took a buyout like I did. She was, one of, she was a science editor who was a, a longtime environmental writer. She's still writing for the paper on a contract. Um, the industry, as it goes onto the web, we don't know what to do to make enough money to still have a thousand people spread around the world collecting information and conveying it authoritatively. So we try experiments on Dot Earth. Um, this scientist, Gary Bunn from uh, Washington State, was heading to Siberia a year or two ago with people from Woods Hole, and they were going to do a really interesting project on paleoclimate, rather than me going along, which might have been possible years ago. Now, I took information from them. I said, hey, guys, take, shoot some video, shoot some audio. Send me a little material, and I put this post up on, on the blog. So there's new relationships evolving, in, involving scientists and journalists that aren't conventional reportage. And I'll, again, I'm going to skip some stuff. Now, and one place where there's no um, dispute is in the underlying issues behind the climate challenge is this in incredible energy insufficiency that we face. And there, if the, if the dialogue, if you care about climate and you're not really focusing like a laser on energy, then you're missing an opportunity because this is just a very quick shot that I think is just as iconic as the, the, the bubbles of air and water. 50 years of American 
spending on science, basic research, federal funding. Sputnik happened. Remember the Soviets got into space. We freaked out. The yellow band there is the space race. So we got busy on space. We kind of did that. The purple band at the top is medical research, not, not building hospitals, but doing fundamental research on cancer. So we cared a lot about that. Tens of billions a year it got up to. The green ribbon is energy. Is, that's, that's the energy quest we've been on for the last 50 years. And you can see during the oil crisis, there was a ramp up in our spending proportionally in, in uh, energy research. And then it dribbled away. It didn't matter if you were Republican or Democrat in, in the White House, whatever. Dribble, 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 dribble. And then way over at the right, you can see the stimulus. So now it's a grand enterprise. You've seen how many press releases that, did you see the last year no, with the energy, green jobs, blah, blah. And not, energy research is just a proxy for broader interest. And this just says to me, we're still totally asleep on the fundamental thing that is required to get us into gear to have a smooth ride, and relatively smooth ride in the next few decades. Um, one last thing on the perceptual stuff, the science, and there is actual science on how people perceive messages. Support for a cap and trade policy. The bubbles here, this was the Yale um, and George Mason University, Six Americas study. Essentially, they found that there are six kind of attitudes on climate, ranging from alarmed to dismissive. And the bubble is the size of the, the group relative to the others. Um, by the way, the concerned, they've shrunk since then. The, uh, but you can see for cap and trade, climate policy, even the concerned and alarmed were, were marginal. They were just at the mid, basically up is yes, down is no. The, the dismissives, of course, were totally no. On support for providing, basically for pushing on clean energy, everybody, including the dismissives, is, if, at, at, is at least marginal or very positive. So when you, if staying in the sense that we have to fight to convince people that global warming is dangerous is so doomed. <laughs> if that's your goal, it's kind of like, it's fine, you know, you can put out your videos and do your stuff, but if you really want to change policy, that fight is purely paralytic compared to what could happen on energy. And if you just look at Dot Earth the last few days, there have been a number of posts on related uh, things. So again, like if you distill it down to the bumper sticker, if you wanted to engage your neighbors on fighting the climate crisis or joining the energy quest. And of course, they're both kind of wonky anyway. But if, if you wanted to engage your wonky neighbors on something that was forward-looking, positive, and gets at the fundamental problem underlying the climate challenge, I don't know which you would put on your bumper, but I would put the, the bottom one. And don't look to Cancun or, or Johannesburg for the, uh, the, the breakthroughs. Uh, you know. It's just not going to happen. As I wrote when this uh, conference in Cancun, I mean in Copenhagen, was wrapping up, there were, as the politicians were doing their final negotiations, they were getting ready for a design show, a home design show in the same facility. And it just, it just struck me as meaningless. When there are young people who are energy innovators, like this kid and, and, uh, at MIT, right over the river, he was 18 when he designed a, uh, a two-wheeled, gyroscopically stabilized uh, electric motorcycle. And you're not going to solve global warming with 9 billion electric motorcycles, especially not if they're getting their electricity from coal. But it's, it, it's his, his story is a much richer and more exciting story to tell than, than that story. So I'll stop there. And uh, by the way, there, it's this, these demonstrators were correct. That sign at Copenhagen says there is no planet B. And they were absolutely right. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much, uh, Andy, for, for, for that, that broad and encompassing view of, 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 of where the public perception and the science connect or not. Uh, let me go straight ahead to our second speaker, Mike Punano. Uh, he is, as I said, a member of the Yes Men and also an associate professor of media arts at RPI. Right, so uh, let's see, can you hear me? Whew. This isn't going to be easy, but I'm going to try. This is, uh, I'm here to speak about transatlantic perceptions of climate change. 
Perceptions differ across the Atlantic. Okay, all right, all right. I, I gotta. St I'll, I'll stop right there. I just. It just happens to be on my computer, which is really fortunate because what uh, what we do, the Yes Men, that is, is um, create publicity stunts uh, for activist issues, and we usually work in tandem with activist campaigns. And it so happens that uh, since there is so much kind of misperception about climate change, it's an issue that we work on a lot. And it is also the kind of um, the mother of all issues at the moment. It's become an umbrella under which pretty much all of the social and environmental justice movements can fit. Um, a lot of what we do involves impersonating people and thus the... Uh, the, the failed attempt at being a scientist. The thing is, it's actually hard to be a scientist. It's really easy to be a business person <laughs> because they don't, they generally don't say anything except, I mean, except for like, uh, and, uh, you know, except for, let's say, a few words strung together that suggest uh, pursuing the profit motive. Um, whereas with science, it's a little more complicated. We've gone to a lot of, uh, conferences where we impersonated captains of industry, um, different uh, managers of different companies, Dow Chemical, Exxon Mobil, and we've uh, made various pronouncements that we thought would rile up the audience. We thought they might make people angry. We actually thought that the first time we did it, we would get arrested. We were representing the World Trade Organization at an international trade conference in Salzburg, Austria. And we had a lot of fantasies about what that might be like um, to be arrested and thrown in an Austrian jail. But we didn't actually get to indulge any of the fantasies because even though we were suggesting things like um, outlawing or creating a free market in democracy by allowing individuals to sell their votes directly to corporations through the internet, um, the audience sort of, their eyes kind of glazed over and they they came up afterward and still asked for our business cards. We were, we were the most uh, important people in the room, at least in their minds, and so nothing that we could say would shake their faith in our importance. And that's part of why we're called, we call ourselves the Yes Men, and this is also part of what I think the problem that we face with climate change, particularly here in this country, um, it's not just the issue of perception, but um, also uh, the issue of whether we can change and whether we can, um, in a way, transcend the culture that we've created. Um, so, regardless, a lot of people want to try to do something about it. And um, one of the ways that we, one of the tactics that we use is to do things that are surprising and arresting and unexpected. Um, we went to Copenhagen last year. I'm going to tell one story about a project that we did. Um, we work with activist organizations generally. We try to contact them, figure out what they want, or they contact us. In this case, it was a group of Canadians who wrote us email and said, we are Canadians and we're embarrassed that we've become a ma massive climate criminal. And uh, we didn't really know a whole lot about it. Uh, so we started talking to them. And sure enough, we found out that Canada sucks. We didn't know. We had that weird American perception that they were OK. Luckily, they fixed us. Um, and now we know Canada is really bad. So um, we started plotting with them what we could do uh, in the lead up to Copenhagen. It's very hard to do so anything that matters at a big event where um, there's the, the, the attention of the world is focused. I mean, it sounds sort of counterintuitive, but from an activist perspective, most of the press is there to uh, tell a story that they already, they already know what the story is before they go. They, you know, and, and right now, so many journalists are under so much pressure to deliver content on extreme deadlines. I think part of the downsizing of the industry has resulted in journalists doing three jobs or four jobs, where they used to be able to file a story a day sometimes. Some of them are doing not only a story, but also video, blogging, you know, sometimes two stories a day. It's an insane workload. And so uh, to cover anything that's out of the ordinary is actually much more work and anything that requires research. So our goal um, in going into Copenhagen was to try to figure out how to um, get a word in edgewise 
where we kind of had a feeling that the stories would all be similar unless there was some breakthrough. And word on the street was that there wasn't going to be any breakthrough. There weren't going to be any um, any uh, real, there wasn't going to be real news about progress coming out of there. So uh, the Canadians had been talking to us. Meanwhile, we got our funding to do something from an art school. So we went and did a workshop with a bunch of art students in Aarhus. Um, and so they were involved. And then we also got in contact with a group called ActionAid, who has an international training program for activists. And so they brought in a group of African activists who uh, kind of represented you know, the receiving end of the, the climate problem. They were people who were coming out of communities where they already were seeing the effects of, uh, of climate change and where they were looking to find money for adaptation. They were specifically in Copenhagen to try to get the idea of climate debt into the heads of the Europeans, Americans, people of the developed world who would, they expected would be paying that climate debt. So when we finally got this whole big coalition together, we had to decide what to do. And what we tended to do is masquerade as, uh, as people in power. We showed them some examples, and we decided that this time around, we would try to be Canada. And how does one be Canada? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I can't really think of what Jim Prentice looks like. Um, and anyway, we, we'd have a hard time playing any particular individual. But we decided that we might be able to get into the conference center, but then we realized that that was actually fairly complicated as well. And we, we did have some offers for help, and there were numerous individuals who, who were willing to, to uh, sort of smuggle us in in various ways, but then we didn't know really what we would do there. Again, it's the problem of trying to get a word in edgewise where everybody sort of has stories that they know they want to tell. So rather than, rather than actually say something at the conference center, we decided to make our own. And uh, the art students rebuilt a set in a basement in downtown Copenhagen that looked a lot like the plenary lecture podium uh, from the, uh, the, the COP15 Bella Center um, sort of location. We also did another set that was, uh, that was the, what, uh, the media panel room where people would be interviewed by the media following. Um, so we prepared that. And then each we cast one of the Canadians as a as a representative of Canada, one and one of the Africans stepped up to represent the interests of Uganda, and I'll just show you the video and then I think you'll understand. Um, oops, hang on. Wow, that sounds so much better. All right. Well, while Terry was looking through those documents, the world was laughing at Canada because of another one. It surfaced as a press release, or so everyone believed. But soon it was clear Canada had been punked. Leslie McKinnon reports. First, there was this demo inside Parliament. 20 or so protesters who caused a minor stir. Then this Greenpeace caper. But that got mostly reported as a breach of security story. Neither managed to get Canada's climate policy as much attention in Copenhagen as today's multi-layered hoax. The day began with this press release, announcing the astonishing news that Canada was suddenly doubling its emissions cuts to 40% below 1990 levels by 2020, and that it would generously pony up 13 billion dollars to be allocated to the African countries for emissions reduction. Then there was this article about it on what looked like the Wall Street Journal's website. Then this, a news conference purportedly by the Ugandan delegate posted on what looked like the Copenhagen conference website. Dearest delegates, it looked amazingly real until the speaker compared Canada's oil reserves to a loaded gun. And seemed ready to pull the trigger on millions of us around the globe. You left us no choice but to see you as criminal. But a press release from Environment Canada followed that seemingly deplored the spoof releases and false hopes. This turned out to be a hoax. 
In fact, it was all a hoax. You think it's a game, but it's not a game, it's a serious issue. You're playing games, I'm not playing games. However, truth can be stranger than fiction. This is the Prime Minister's spokesman blaming the stunt on Stephen Gilbo of the environment group Equitaire. And I want an apology. And this is also the real thing. I was in the plenary session at the time that this happened, and I really can't comment any further. Why is it a hoax that Canada's going to do the right thing? This environmentalist thinks the whole elaborate joke worked. I had nothing to do with this one, but I'm really happy that they did it. As to who pulled this off, there are reports tonight it's a group of pranksters who call themselves the Yes Men. They say they'll have a press conference tomorrow, if you can believe that. Leslie McKinnon, CBC News, Ottawa. All right, so uh, we did have that press conference tomorrow, um, and uh, we there we put uh, forth Kadili Chandia, who's the Ugandan woman who made the announcement, the fake announcement on behalf of Uganda. And uh, she spoke to international press at the conference. And then more importantly, over the next three or four days, she did a press tour of Canada. And she was on radio stations all over. Dozens of radio stations had her on, on talk radio. And she was able to express directly to the people in Canada who are allowing the tar sands to continue to be exploited uh, by not pressuring their government to stop it, uh, she was able to explain to them what, what effect that would have if, if they continued to pollute at that level. And so it was a way to sort of allow uh, somebody who was um, activating on behalf of, of people who were seeing the effects of climate change um, and who didn't have the money to adapt, it was a way of connecting them to the people who were kind of uh, creating the problem. And so that was incredibly rewarding, this whole process. Um, and so much so that since we'd, we'd set up a kind of infrastructure for, coll for collaboration, we decided to make it mo a more official thing. And now we're doing a thing that we call the Yes Lab, where we do workshops with organizations. If anybody's seen any of our movies, we used to do things where me or Andy would end up up on stage um, in these roles doing the impersonations. But we've kind of dropped that now. People often wonder if we can continue because we get more recognized. But it's not a problem if you have people like Kodili stepping up and, and uh, offering, despite the risk, to uh, go ahead and um, represent Uganda. And uh, apparently the, uh, the, the real Ugandan reps are pretty amused by it all, um, and they, they quite enjoyed it. So uh, anyway, that leads me to the thing I was going to show. I'll just show you one more thing. Um, today... Today we're, we've, we're working on some entertain, an entertaining campaign with Rainforest Action Network. There's a great bunch of campaigners. Um, this was a headline today in Fast Company. It says, Chevron's new ad campaign is a slick yes men hoax. Now, this headline itself is confusing because <laughs> Chevron launched a major ad campaign today. Um, and... They do the, the, in this little image here, you see it says oil companies should clean up their messes. And it features an indigenous uh, man from Ecuador who, um, who's where right now um, Chevron is involved in a major lawsuit. But uh, this isn't a slightly altered ad, but Chevron's real campaign actually does look like this. It just has earnest looking people, earnest looking children and adults. Um, and then it has various statements about what oil companies should do and the phrase, we agree. It's called their We Agree campaign. But the Rainforest Action Network had gotten some uh, leaked documents. Um, they had gotten the whole campaign, basically. Somebody turned it over to them, and uh, they came to us and said, let's do one of these Yes Lab things and collaborate on something. So we came up with a response and launched the campaign today. And there's been a lot of confusion. People are having trouble telling the difference between Chevron's ads and ours, which I think is part of the, the process. In this case, we're, we're interested in um, unveiling the greenwashing, but also in kind of using the same tactics of subterfuge that are used against us <laughs> and against the environment. I mean, in this case, we see that, the, that, that our lies are meant to reveal the truth about the Chevron lies. So. Um, that's about it, and I, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to the, the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike.
uh, we'll, we'll move right along to Stephen, and he's going to talk about uh, the yes men, I guess. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was going to give a talk about the yes men, but he gave it, so I'm stuck with giving this boring talk that he also has on his computer now, unfortunately. So. Yes, uh, of course, I'm the scientist, and therefore, I'm, uh, it's my job to be boring here. <laughs> and so I approach it in the typical way. I looked at what is the topic, and it's about the transatlantic perceptions of climate. And I actually, I had a real hard time um, thinking, what could I possibly say on this topic, like never before, because usually I go to natural science conferences, and then I know I'm going to give my lecture about our latest research. And it's all very simple. And uh, what do I, as a natural scientist, have to say about perceptions and uh, differences across the Atlantic? It's a tough job. The first point I can make as a scientist is that uh, the perceptions amongst the, the climate scientists don't actually differ across the Atlantic or actually anywhere else in the world. I've worked with scientists from Asia, from Africa, Russia, South America, you name it. And we basically all uh, agree as much as scientists agree. And where we disagree, it has nothing to do with our cultural backgrounds. I think that the, the way that natural scientists look at their data, interpret the data, is, is not very strongly colored by uh, wherever they come from, what their political views are, etc. So if, if there is differences across the Atlantic in perception of the climate problem, I think it's not due to their climate science communities that exist on either side. So in a way, I could stop here because I'm the natural scientist. And so it's not us that makes the difference, I don't think. So I don't know much about the rest. I, I think it has something to do with cultural differences that are outside science. And um, I thought, since I've come across from Europe, I should perhaps, um, as my introduction to the discussion that we're going to have, uh, give some examples of what the perception and discussion about this issue actually is over in Europe and uh, just give you some example of what we have been publicly debating there in the last few months. And I think one of the, the key differences in perception actually comes from the fact that in Europe the emissions are falling, whereas in the United States they're increasing and increasing and increasing. And I find that it breeds the kind of pessimism that uh, Andy has referred to, the kind of petri dish, and um, we're going to grow and grow and grow, and there's nothing we can do, basically, because we are not smart enough as a species. Uh, that's, that's the perception that you might get when you're actually stuck in a situation where it's growing, 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 whereas in Europe, um, we are maybe a little bit more optimistic in that sense, because uh, um, amongst the European Union 15, which originally was the, the number of uh, European nations when the Kyoto Protocol uh, was signed. We had a Kyoto target of minus 8%, and uh, we are going to overachieve that. You can see the, the green bar, that's the EU Kyoto target, and we're already below it. And of course, there is a, a drop in 2009 because of the economic crisis, so it will go back up again a bit, but it's, it looks pretty certain that we will be um, below that target, and GDP has grown 45% since 1990 in Europe. So while GDP has grown 45%, emissions have gone, gone down uh, more than 8%. So that's a somewhat more optimistic message. Um, one of the debates that we had in Europe is about the future targets. Um, there's been a lot of debate about the minus 20 versus minus 30% by 2020. Uh, this diagram basically illustrates the emissions trajectory in the past with the future targets. The, the European Union's target for 2050 is minus 80 percent. And uh, so you can immediately see on that diagram that the minus 20 percent for 2020 is weak. It kind of deviates from that downward track that we are um, planning to take. And that's why, for example, uh, three environment ministers, the German, the French, and the British environment minister, wrote a joint newspaper article that was published in a number of European papers uh, some weeks ago, uh, saying the European Union should change its target to minus 30% by 2020. That was quite a remarkable step. Um, 
The European Union has just recently, however, reconfirmed that they want to stick with the minus 20% because it argues, uh, of course, uh, the official target is minus 20%, but we will do minus 30 if other countries uh, go to a similar effort. So the, the European uh, Commission sees that as its bargaining chip um, to put on the table for Cancun, so they don't want to give that away by already committing to minus 30%. It's more a kind of tactical debate, if you like. Uh, there's also been a debate on whether this minus 80% target for 2050 is actually adequate, uh, considering that we want to limit warming below 2 degrees, which is a long-standing European Union goal since the 1990s. And uh, the science, science can work out what amount of total emissions that allows. Uh, for CO2, that's really a total amount because of the long lifetime uh, of CO2 in the atmosphere. And uh, these three curves are three hypothetical emission pathways up to 2050 that all involve the same total emissions. So the area below these three curves is the same. Um, but they have uh, different peaking years where the global emissions start to go down. It's been called as the, the ski slope diagram uh, because uh, the green one is a kind of flat beginner slope and the red one is a kind of uh, horrendous uh, breakneck ski slope here. And w with these three scenarios, we would have a two-thirds probability of uh, stopping global warming at this two-degree limit that was also agreed upon in Copenhagen last year. And even in the most over-optimistic case, where we uh, peak the emissions uh, next year, basically, we would have to get the global emissions down by 80% in 2050 uh, in order to stay below 2 degrees. And that is the global emissions. Because the industrial nations have much higher per capita emissions, they have to take a greater share. And that's why many people uh, in Europe argue that if Europe goes for minus 80% by 2050, that's totally inadequate, and we should be aiming for minus 95%. So that's the kind of discussion that we uh, are having over there. Um, a little bit about the German discussion, which I'm, of course, most familiar with and which also has been uh, quite intense over this summer. Uh, first of all, the German emissions have also been uh, declining. They're actually now... In 2008, they've been 22 percent below the 1990 level. Uh, 2009, we have this extra drop because of the economic crisis. I expect that to come up again in 2010. Um, uh, Germany actually has this target of minus 40 percent in 2020 that you just all laughed about when it was announced for Canada. Um, this is uh, German policy. And uh, the, I mentioned we had this intense debate over this summer which is about the German energy strategy, because our government, uh, which is a conservative government in a coalition with a kind of uh, free market liberal party, uh, has devised an energy strategy, which has just uh, been published, as you can see, on 28 September. So it's very recent, and that uh, was after a very intense uh, phase of uh, discussions and getting scientific uh, input from various uh, groupings, etc. i just summarize the key points here. This uh, goes for, uh, I already said, 40% by 2020. It's been a long-standing uh, German target, 55% reduction by 2030. And here we see that debate that was between is 80% adequate. Uh, it's reflected by the government now saying in a kind of non-committal way, anywhere between 80 and 95 percent reduction of our emissions by the year 2050. Um, the share of renewables in the total end energy uh, use uh, is, uh, should be 30 percent by 2030 and 60 percent by 2050. Uh, in electricity, it's uh, 50 percent by 2030 and 80 percent by 2050. Um, each year, 2% of the buildings uh, should be renovated so that by 2050, practically all buildings have a, a very uh, good energy efficiency standard. Uh, this more than doubles the current normal rate of uh, 
building renovation, which would take more than 100 years until we have all the buildings energy efficient. In Germany, of course, uh, our old buildings are the big problem. We are not a growing population, so it's not a question like in Asia or so, how do we build new cities, new buildings in an efficient way? It's what do we do with all the old building stock that will still be around in 50 and even uh, 100 years from now. Energy use for transportation should be cut by 40%. Um, of course, the interesting bit will be then, these are all announcement, what is the government actually going to do to achieve those? There is a scientific process of every three years um, monitoring the progress towards these goals. And uh, there actually is already quite a lot of uh, legislation that has passed in recent years about efficiency standards and so on. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely pessimistic that uh, this are uh, just all announcement that will not be delivered upon. I, th I think there is a pretty good chance that uh, these targets can be and will be achieved. Now, what are those big discussions? The big debates uh, that we have in Germany are not um, about does this make sense, should we reduce emissions that much, etc. Everybody agrees on that. There are about other things. For example, uh, the biggest debate is about uh, the slower nuclear phase-out that the government uh, has announced. We in Germany, of course, had for many years a policy to phase out our nuclear power stations, and now the government has extended their lifetime uh, by, on average, I think it's about 12 years or so. And uh, it's in quite interesting that the government is selling this as a bridge to the future based on renewable energy, whereas, um, uh, yeah, it actually comes with taking a lot of money from the nuclear industry, which earns uh, many billions extra, of course, if you let them run their power plants longer. The government is siphoning off uh, some of that money and wants to invest it into renewables. So you would think that the uh, quite influential and big uh, wind power industry, solar power industry in Germany would be very happy about this, but the opposite is uh, the case. And also all the expert, um, scientific experts on energy issues uh, are completely against this because uh, this is seen not as a bridge towards this renewable energy future, but rather as a kind of a stumbling block on the way to a future of, with renewable energies because uh, there are a number of problems here. Uh, one is financial. Uh, these nuclear power stations have been written off and now they deliver very cheap electricity after they, of course, have uh, received several hundred billion uh, euros of, su of subsidy in the past, if you count this all together, and are actually still subsidized. But uh, on the market, on the electricity spot market, they appear as a, a very cheap source of electricity which prevents investments into alternatives because uh, you can't so easily sell uh, other forms of electricity while this huge block of nuclear electricity is still there in the market. Um, and the other issue is the, the crunch with our grid capacity in Germany. Wind power is fluctuating, of course, and uh, it is uh, competing in the grid with uh, the nuclear power stations which cannot be, uh, they're not responsive to this very fast uh, fluctuating source, uh, unlike a gas power station, for example, which you can, within minutes, you can increase or decrease their power output. Um, with a nuclear power station, you can only do that within uh, very narrow limits. And we already have so much wind power in the, in the German grid now that uh, on a windy day when the demand is low, it supplies more than 100% of the demand and we've had the electricity prices uh, dropping to negative values on the spot electricity market in Germany, so that um, you would be paid by uh, taking electricity out of the grid, basically, because there was, um, it was very windy uh, on the North Sea coast, and the wind power stations were supplying more than was needed. And, um, of course, if you want those guys to turn the, the windmills off, you have to pay them because they get a guaranteed feed-in tariff for feeding in that power. Um, so that was one of the big debates. Uh, the other one is I, I showed you there that 60% renewable energy in 2050 is the government's goal. 
and practically all the advisory bodies to the German uh, government, uh, as well as the Umweltbundesamt, which is like the EPA equivalent, uh, issued their own report. They have all been advising the government to go to 100% renewable by 2050 and not 60%. And uh, so that, that is another issue that, that is being debated here. So I think we have a probably rather different debate because we don't have uh, one party saying, no, it's all a hoax and we don't need to do anything much about uh, the climate issue and, and uh, uh, the other party trying to do something but rather we have a kind of conservative, uh, liberal, free market coalition government which has announced these goals and we have opposition parties uh, which say uh, these are not going far enough and we have uh, many parts of the civil society, uh, we have uh, the scientific community which are saying this is not really um, enough what the government is doing here. We can, um, with existing technologies go 100% renewable at current costs. That's also an important point. It's not getting more expensive if you do that, our electricity supply, but it's also not going to happen by itself because initially in the next couple of decades, you have to invest a lot of money in the grid infrastructure, etc. And then over decades after that, it slowly starts paying back so that overall by 2050, um, it won't have cost us more than continuing with a present fossil fuel energy system. Uh, we have a similar discussion in Denmark, uh, for example, where a government, uh, uh, an expert committee set up by the government that has worked over the past two years has just issued a, a report with recommendations for Denmark's energy future and they've also come up with uh, this a recommendation of being 100% renewable by 2050. So, some points for the discussion that we are now about to enter. Um, I think one of the key differences, of course, is that the discussion in Europe is a lot less polarized, it's a lot less ideological and a lot uh, more pragmatic, and it's not focused on whether we need to confront the climate crisis, but how best to do that, about which, of course, there are legitimate uh, different opinions. And although usually Europeans are kind of, uh, we, we have the reputation of being pessimistic and the North Americans, you know, optimistic, we can do this, etc. With this issue, it seems to be the other way around. In Europe, it's largely seen as a problem that can be solved. Whereas uh, when I talk to colleagues from America, they are a lot more pessimistic. And it's not that, it's not a technological pessimism, it's more a pessimism about uh, society, whether society can actually change like that. And I think uh, maybe in Europe we, are, uh, we have different attitude uh, towards that uh, because one possible explanation would be that we have a different lifestyle already, we uh, emit a lot less per capita, about half uh, of what a typical North American person emits. Uh, we have, we live closer together on smaller piece of land and we have over centuries we are used to accept that there are boundaries and we just we can't just all do what we would like to do. Uh, we also I think have a lot less uh, fear of government regulation. We accept that governments have an important role to play and I think that is one of the, the deeper rooted reasons for resistance uh, by these climate skeptics group or so. These, they usually don't have anything, uh, any real problem with the climate science or so. I think what they basically, what drives them is a fear that this will lead to government regulation and it's a kind of ideological stance that government is bad. And uh, just when I arrived in my hotel from the airport today, I turned on the uh, television and I saw Sarah Palin saying just that very emphatically that kind of uh, power has to be given back to the people and the government has to be shrunk and be very small in its powers and unfortunately I don't think we'll uh, be able to solve this problem without some amount of regulation because uh, of course there are a lot of technological uh, solutions like the renewable energy, but why are they growing exponentially in Germany at a rate like doubling every four years or so? It's because the government set the right incentives uh, with a feed-in tariff. It's the most important single piece of legislation that did that. 
Um, I think there are also differences in the media culture. The, we might touch on those in the discussion, this balance as bias problem that's quite well known. Um, maybe uh, in Europe we still have more specialized science journalists and uh, another point that maybe we can discuss with Andy is whether um, the European journalism tradition, uh, reporters are less afraid to make judgments um, I think America has a very strong tradition of separating reporting from opinion and the reporting is just reporting and then if you just report, um, well this scientist says that and uh, another scientist says the opposite, etc., then you get this um, pseudo balance, whereas uh, a lot of the German science journalists that I uh, know, when they get a piece of kind of Russian scientist has found that cosmic rays cause all global warming, they recognize that as crap and they just don't report on it and they, they just, they're not afraid to make a judgment on that point. Now since it's also about art, I wanted to just finish off by this little piece of nice graffiti art uh, in London. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. We've had, we've had three, three very interesting and also three very different uh, presentations because we wanted three very different presentations and we wanted three very different experiences. Uh, by way of bringing them back and before I, before I open, um, open, open to questions from the audience, maybe I wanted to see if any of you have any, any comments or reactions to your colleagues on the, on, on, on the dais. If not, I, I, I certainly do. Mike? Yeah, uh, well, um, that the, the last presentation, I mean, I, I think that what we see as a thread through all of these is this, uh, I, what stuck with me especially was the last uh, things you were mentioning about reporting. And um, we do have exactly this problem, uh, this sort of how reporters uh, in this country validate um, or how editorial boards often require uh, what what might be mistaken for balance, <laughs> um, you know, when when you have to have another voice, like if if you if you had to report on uh, what was happening during World War II, and you always had to put Hitler's opinion into the article, <laughs> I don't know if they would they would appreciate it here in Boston, you know. It's the, but it's that kind of thing that's infected the sort of idea of reportage in the U.S. and and it you know it becomes an issue. <laughs> When it comes, when it's especially when it's something like climate science, where there is no, I mean, there is no appreciable debate. You know, I, I, yesterday I had this exactly happen to me at UCLA, where there was a, a student, a theater student, who said, "Yeah, well, since climate change isn't really my opinion about climate change, I'm not going to talk about that." And we said, "What do you mean your opinion about climate change? <laughs> what are you talking about?" And it turned out that he had this conspiracy theory vision of it. And, 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 you know, UCLA student, one of the best schools in the country. So, and it, he got it from reading these articles where there was always a counter opinion expressed, so. But, but is that true? I mean, I was struck, uh, Andy, in your presentation, is, is it really a lack of, a lack of uh, ability or, 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 or tradition of making a judgment? I mean, your presentation as a journalist was, there was plenty of judgment there. Oh yeah, well, the, my, but but I've switched my gears. You know, I when I I, um, I was a news reporter at the New York Times and throughout my career. I, so you've moved to the opinion. I'm now, now at my blog in the spring. Moved to the op-ed side of the paper because I, when I left the staff, the Times has no tradition of uh, freelance contributor doing daily regular news reporting. So they didn't know what to do with me. I mean, we're in a realm of new stuff, new. And, and actually, it makes me more like what you would see in Germany, where there are people who have experience as news reporters who also write a column that's quite expresses strong views. Richard Black at the BBC, one of the best people I know on this beat, uh, is, writes with a rich voice. Um, there are these issues, though, that, that are important to, to consider. One is that there is no such thing as a global warming story. And the story of the day is about the climate bill, which is not a science story. That's a story about policy. And there, everybody's opinion has a, has a place in an article. So there are stories about the climate challenge that are very much about opinions. And they, that include Exxon's opinion and libertarian opinions. And, 
And then the science, again, as I said, is just the cage around the cage fight. The, if you're talking about sea ice, you know, what's happening with sea ice in the Arctic or what's happening with ocean acidification, that, if you apply that shallow, crutchy, you know, he says, she says approach there, you're doomed to misinform your readers because on sea ice, on ocean acidification, on most of the specific questions about global warming, there still is a, a wide range of scientific opinion in terms of how fast the Arctic could, could uh, be de-iced, how, um, how high seas will go, how fast. Uh, you wrote that valuable column in Nature Online, Nature Reports, whatever. There were two columns by, by publishing scientists who were saying, uh, trying to be more uh, precise about what we know and don't know about sea level rise. So, so, and then the other issue, I mean, there's a bunch of issues in the newsroom, shrinking newsroom, for sure, less resources, less time, as, as you heard before. The average reporter now is doing three or four things in place of the one that, that might have done before. Uh, so but, but, so but, you can't but, fit the stuff in. But in fairness, isn't that a newer phenomena than the larger phenomena of climate and reporting? I mean, the, the, the shrinking newsroom is, is, is also a newer story, or am I wrong? Is a news is a newer. It's a new story. And, yes, and the, the trends that we are seeing were the same even when the newsroom was not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the balance the balance issue is is definitely something that the reporter has to work against because, uh, but 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 the impediment of limited time. If you're not a trained reporter who hasn't spent 20 years grappling with climate science like a few of us unfortunates, then you are going to go on Google, find a couple of people at .edu websites who write about the thing that's in the news and do the, the balance thing, and it's terrible. And in a world of shrinking specialized reporting, you're going to see more simplistic coverage. And again, in a world of 24-7 journalism, where you have less time to make those judgments and to learn what is ocean acidification, which is actually less alkaline, not more acid, you know, you're going to see more sloppy stuff. Unfortunately, it's just it's not. This is not going to get better. Which means scientists have to do more to get the to convey to do what what Stefan and others have done at places like RealClimate.org, where they created their own portal to the public, and it's, and it's a pain in the ass. I'm sure, Gavin and Michael and you, it's not enjoyable, but it's vital. I think. Before I open up for questions, I know we have a question there. Stephen, you probably didn't mean to imply this, but as I was listening to your, your talk, and especially the middle portion of it, it struck me that you, you, know, you rightly said this, there's no difference in the science. You go to a scientific conference in Berlin, as I was the last week, or to, in Boston, it's, it's the same conversations. It's, it's the same arguments. It's the same, same type of data. It's the same type of ideas. Uh, but in the middle section, it seemed that you were suggesting that maybe it's not the media either. Uh, maybe it's policy. Maybe it's that the Europe is in a different place in its climate policy trajectory. And the tough intake of policy has already happened. So if you are already seeing that these renewables have been adopted and you've adapted to that and it wasn't that difficult anyhow, then a lot of the venom has been taken away from the conversation. Or am I over-reading what you said? Um, well, I think that's true. And uh, of course, uh, especially Germany is also making a lot of money by exporting renewable energy technology. Um, so the opportunities are also seen by many people there. But I think um, the same would apply to the United States, you know. Why shouldn't the United States, uh, which is also a high-tech uh, country, be market leaders in wind power or solar or whatever? Um, so that doesn't explain the difference, I think, between uh, Europe and over here. Um, I also, I wouldn't just blame it on the media, obviously, uh, because I think it's a, it's a more deeper-rooted cultural issue where the media, they're just one little piece in the mosaic. Okay. Let me let me open up. We have a question, lady at the back there. We'll take two or three questions. If you could jot down the points, and then we'll come back and take a round robin here. Just a quick question. If you um, could also uh, say who you are. Oh, sorry. My name is Miranda Loud, and I run a nonprofit called Nature Stage, um, to use the performing arts to um, bring attention to current environmental issues. And I was wondering um, if there are any reporters working for the Times or in, in for major papers in Europe who are focusing on resilience in communities like bypassing is climate change happening and what can 
people in Washington do about it or major governments do about it, and actually talking about grassroots, you know, um, <laughs> emergency measures for, for bonding communities, um, just for the emotional stuff that people are going through because it's such a huge, it's hard to get your head around. Okay. We have a question up here. Uh. Hi, Peter Frumhoff at the Union of Concerned Scientists. I would just, a quick comment, I think the metaphor of the cage is more applicable to the European context where people accept the reality of climate change than it may be in the US context where many folks are trying to wish the cage away. Um, just as a, as a comment, but the, the question, I, I've spent a lot of time interacting with European activists and scientists about the reality of climate change and we'll be having that conversation while they're chain smoking cigarettes. Um, and I, what, what I'm really in the sort of transatlantic perception of risk and vulnerability to different kinds of risks, I'm curious whether any of you have any sense of why um, Americans have taken the risk of smoking cigarettes to heart in terms of regulation, whereas the Europeans, again, to vastly overgeneralize, of course, uh, seem to. Uh, you know, see that as a different frame of reference, as a, you know, something that, that is not worthy of that kind of regulation relative to climate. Very good, very, very good, very good uh, comparison. We'll take one more up here, if, uh, and maybe two more, and then we'll come back to our panelists before they forget the questions. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. My name's Rich Minton. I'm involved in green building advocacy in some local uh, grassroots groups uh, around recycling and advocacy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, I, I take your point about balance is bias, but you know, for decades now, I've yearned to have that problem back again. Uh, I mean, it seems like the real problem we have in this country in terms of becoming informed is bias presented as balance. And it just seems that there's so much corporate message, I mean, not even counting the Supreme Court's recent ruling, that you know, the comfort food that's being pumped out in, in Andrew's term is so much in favor of, don't worry about it, you know, Europe, what do they know? We won the war. You know, I mean, I'm serious. Uh, and, and you know, we're such a consumer nation, and we've been convinced to buy cheaper and cheaper stuff and replace it more and more often. I mean, that to me seems the cultural bias. We don't have any sense of quality anymore here. And that's because it's drummed into us by very much, you know, quarterly reports must make a profit every time uh, corporate thinking. And we just don't have, we don't have a government that can get away from that. Thank you. We'll take one last one in the front and then come back to our panel. And then we'll take another round of questions. But Hi, my name's Roger Shamel. I'm with the Global Warming Education Network. We're a nonprofit based in Lexington home of the American Energy Revolution, the American Revolution, and we hope it'll be home of the American Energy Revolution. My question and comment would be that, um, is there some way that the rest of the world could help America smarten up a little <coughs> bit about this? Because as an American who's worked in Germany and who went to Copenhagen and who's seen the different, frankly, I'm almost embarrassed to be an American. I'm, I'm not running for office, so I'm gonna say that, but we're all on one planet together, and uh, Europe may have looked to America as a leader following the world wars, but I think now we need to be following you, and if we don't follow you, because we're all going down together if we don't change, I think the rest of the world should start looking at something like economic sanctions or something really strong to get American attention. Or maybe your leaders could talk to Obama and get him to speak to the doubting Americans so that they know that this is more than just a hoax. And but but I, I do get the smoking down, too. I just want to say one more thing. I, I am happy to meet Andy because I've read your column, and I also read Joe Rome's column. And even hearing you talk now today, you do sound wishy-washy if I were reading your column, I can't understand if you're really concerned or whether you think this is still something that you have to leave your reader wondering what's going on. And I feel it's more the latter and that you're doing a disservice to Americans by leaving it in question. What's the it? <laughs> That's an important question. What is the it? What is the what? What is the it in your sentence? Leaving what in question? Leaving 
it, oh, thank you, I, I understand. Leaving the question of whether or not climate change is A, real, B, serious, and C, something we need to act on now, not someday in the future. The third part of your question is not a science question, and that's the arena where I broaden the discussion. How do you do, how fast? Well, it's, a, it's a question of ethics. It's, you could say the miners in Chile were rescued by capitalism, which I've read from the Heartland Institute, because a company in Pennsylvania the drills, yeah. developed the drills, but they weren't rescued because there was a profit. They were rescued because people cared about those miners. And right. I'm here speaking as a parent and a grandparent who cares about my kids and my grandkids, and I don't want them holding a gun to fight their neighbors to get food and water in the next five or 10 years. That's what's at stake here. Okay. Thank you. So a bunch of tough Back questions, to strong statements, reactions, responses, anyone, all of you. Well, let me, let me go first, just to, to address some of those points. Um, you, ha you must have missed some of the posts and some of my articles over the last 20 years if you think I don't see this as a problem. Um, there, the reality, there's basically, I can give you a URL. I've grouped these. I've done several posts on the basics. And I should have shown a slide, or I could show you a slide off, offline later, where the basics are absolutely established. More CO2, warming world, warming world, less size, less ice, higher seas. The specifics on, on the points of science, like the rate of sea level rise, how much sea, sea levels will rise by 2100, is a very tough question. And it's still laden with uncertainty. Anyone who tells you they, can, they know is not being honest. Anyone who tells you, but they can say, we know there's a risk of more than a meter of sea level rise. And so if I want to honestly present to you what to do in a scenario like that, I have to present it as a risk management problem. Like Steven Schneider and like so many other scientists who've d dived into this data for decades would. There is no simple menu. If then, the two degree target that Europe adopted for a long time is, is still at, at, at its root a risk issue. It's not delineated by science. How fast, just don't, don't, do, uh, we, we, let's, 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 let's hear the question. Later I will send you to some, some pieces that I wrote that delineate what is known, what I feel is established, what I feel is an honest discussion of the uh, responses. And, and what I, and we can talk about Joe Rome as well. Okay. So on that point, I'd like to just start with that and then we can go down the list of the other questions. Either of you? Um, well, I will not be able to answer many <laughs> of those questions, I'm afraid. Um, this question about is there a focus on resilience, um, I, I can't answer that. Um, it's, it's as simple as that. I think the issue of the risk of smoking and why is it more regulated here in the US and actually other countries, New Zealand, where I used to live for a few years as well, was uh, very tough on uh, smoking regulations and Europe is kind of lagging behind but also now kind of getting onto this issue. Um, that one I, I can't answer. Obviously um, uh, to, to be make a, just make a cynical comment, uh, the lobbyists were not as effective. We know there's some of the same people, Fred Singer, um, Dick Linson has claimed that chain smoking is harmless because he's also a chain smoker, but they obviously were not, not as convincing on that uh, topic as uh, they have been to some on global warming. <laughs> okay, Mike, did you want to add anything on any of these? Uh, well, I, then maybe you know, I have a question for you. I think I, I hear the the frustration. I think, and I think that this is a, I mean, I think that it's easy to be frustrated with. Um, mainstream uh, science journalism with good reporting uh, that because it's obligated to report on the uncertainties <laughs> you know and uh, and that I think that does present a, a storytelling problem a problem with trying to convey the urgency of an issue because there's always something to seize upon by the people who are pursuing the profit motive in their reporting um, because you know what we have to compete with in terms of the activist position um, on promoting change in, in either public policy on, on climate change or public opinion, what we have to compete with is our massive greenwashing ad campaigns like 
Chevron's uh, human energy campaign or their campaign today. I mean, Chevron's campaign for the last few years, and one of the reasons they're the target of Rainforest Action Network right now, is a campaign they call Human Energy, which um, talks about their obligation to humanity and to people and their commitment to renewable energy. But if you look at their portfolio of renewable energy projects, they're in the middle middle of the road for oil companies and what anybody might consider deplorable by the standards of a European government that's regulating. So, um, you know, when you're when you're fighting, uh, you know, in the case of Chevron, a hundred million dollars a year in budget um, to kind of claw away at what otherwise would be accurate reporting that has loopholes in terms of the arguments to be made. It's not to say uh, then then it, it can be really frustrating. I, I totally see that. Before I open it for, for another round of questions, the, the one thing that I didn't hear, I was surprised not to hear in, in from any of you and in the first round of questions because I thought it would be picked up because we've talked about hoaxes and so on and so forth, is the recent IPCC uh, sort of leak emails, uh, later the issue with the IPCC and the glacier records. And I wanted to see if any of you have any, any reactions to that, not, not to what happened, but whether there were differences in how that was reacted to in different parts of the world. Now, I was in Germany for a week when the glaciers uh, news hit. And I was on a tour that was actually taking me to a lot of news organizations. And then I immediately came here. And I don't know if Beth is still here or not. I think I spoke to her from, from The Globe and others. And it seemed to me very anecdotally that the reaction from the American reporter who would call me about it, since I've worked on the IPCC for a long time, was kind of under the breath saying, see, we told you so. Uh, those, those naysayers were probably right. And the reaction in, in, in Germany, and again, this is totally anecdotal and, and, and based on very little data, was more of the sense, uh, why did you guys let us down? Why weren't you more careful? And that was at least one person's sort of sense of what I was hearing from these, these, these media outlets in these two places. How, 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 how did you, what was, was the type of reaction you were seeing from the media, for example, Stefan? Um, well, I, I remember one thing um, when these um, stolen emails came out. I was uh, rung by a, a science journalist from the Süddeutsche Zeitung about this. And he uh, then, uh, a day or two days later, published uh, one of the first articles about the whole thing. And uh, there I was quite positively surprised. I also often have my problems with the German media. I mean, I, I don't want to portray the kind of... Uh, idea that everything is great in Europe, that's not the case. I mean, we have our own brand of climate skeptics and all that stuff. It's just not quite as, as powerful and um, not as influential in the political world as it is over here, apparently. Uh, but so I was quite positively surprised that he, uh, he had read a lot of those emails and concluded that, um, yeah, there were scientists kind of uh, frankly, privately involved in their conversations, but there, there was nothing terribly scandalous uh, about that, and he, he wrote an article to that extent. Um, but that was just one good example, and Süddeutsche Zeitung is uh, the biggest uh, and also very good German daily newspaper. Uh, there are also other examples, and uh, I think there you, I, I saw clear differences between different European countries because the, the British tabloid press, uh, not, even, not just tabloids actually, I don't think we can call the Sunday Times a tabloid, um, they, they were on the forefront of uh, some of these uh, whatever gates, you know, Amazon gate, Africa gate, etc. A lot of those were actually uh, first came out in articles uh, in the Sunday Times by Jonathan Leakey and uh, Richard North. And so they seem to originate in Britain. But uh, uh, as, as a positive note, the Sunday Times has actually withdrawn uh, a couple of those articles by Leakey and North, uh, and the Telegraph, I think, withdrew that North article about Pachauri and uh, printed an apology, although they only did this after uh, so he went had been done. Uh, after <laughs> Well, after damage had been done and after he took legal steps. Um, 
whereas the Sunday Times withdrew that Amazon Gate article uh, after a British scientist complained to the, the British press, press authority there. Well, can I make one, please, ob one observation I'd like to make about that, that whole saga is that part of the energy that, and enthusiasm that the skeptics derive from this business um, grew out of a faux sense of consensus that had been built into the way science was communicated, climate science was communicated uh, up through the 2007, 2008, 2009, which violates, in other words, if scientists were more energetic and enthusiastic about disagree disagreement being a normal part of how science works, when the veil was lifted with these emails and people were actually being mean and kind of human and doing, saying stupid things, People would just say, that's kind of like us. In other words, scientists are people too. But the, I, I have some problems with the IPCC process because it, 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 by mandate, was trying to kind of articulate a clean, neat, and sober presentation of information that's actually the result of a lot of tensions and dynamics. And if that was known to the public, on a, the average person, more clearly, and that's not the case, certainly, in American. Most Americans learn about science as this you know, and then they were handed down the, not the information about DNA, the, the structure is thus, you know, as if it was kind of, this is all just magically derived information that is revealed. That's, a, that's been a, a sad aspect of this, that, that the cleanliness that was promulgated was really uh, uh, helped fuel some of this in, in some ways. But I, I don't uh, quite understand that because we just discussed how, you know, you have this he says, she says, and you get balance, you get one scientist saying this, and then the article will quote another scientist saying the opposite. So I would have thought that the public is entirely used to the fact that different scientists have, have different views and they argue about things. And um, of course, that's that, just that is very normal. But that's and it also comes out uh, in, in the internet now that we have all these science blogs, you can see that um, you know, as soon as somebody publishes a, a paper, we may, uh, you know, severely criticize it on our blog yeah. because we think the conclusions are wrong, uh, etc. So that I think that uh, I don't think the public has any reason to have this idea that kind of uh, there is this big consensus. Of course, the IPCC's job is to say where is there consensus and where are the areas where we disagree, and that's I think. Is a, is a necessary assessment. Yeah. And, and, and that's very interesting. Let's take a question here, if we can get the mic here, by, while you get the mic. That, you know, those who do science uh, bicker and, and, and differ all the time. That's what we do at conferences. You go to a conference, you present a paper, someone says, I don't like that part, I think it's like this. That's, that's what we do on a daily basis. That's the, the business we are in. Uh, and, and, and yet, sort of, there is the sanitization now, whether it's the journalists who are doing the sanitization, whether he said, she said, or scientists who are giving the wrong impression themselves uh, of consensus, I think is a very, very important point you raise. Yes, sir. Yeah, Franz Maul Sagen from the Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities. Um, I want to bring in a question here, which we discussed on, on our ride from the airport to, um, to actually to our hotels today, picking up Stefan Ramsdorf. And that's the question of, of credibility. Um, actually, I think much of the climate gate thing was about ruining uh, climate science scientists' credibilities. And that's a, a strategy mostly taken by the so-called climate de skeptics, which I co would call climate denialists, by the way. Anyway, but nobody seems to talk about the credibility of so-called climate skeptics. What's the scientific cre credibility of this type of people? And why are so few, if at all any, reports on the credibility of climate skeptics? OK, we'll take another question, gentlemen, at the back right behind. We'll take two questions in the same row, the lady then. Thank you, uh, Jim McCarthy, a uh, biological oceanographer. Uh, Andy, I like your, um, <coughs> your analogy, the cage and the Petri dish. I think it's, uh, it's very helpful. But I think, in part, also, uh, what it doesn't recognize or what you didn't acknowledge is there are a lot of people in this country who deny the reality of the cage. And I think that's, that's part of what Stephen is getting at earlier, is that uh, uh, part of our difficulty, and, and it comes in the point you were just making about expressing uh, uncertainty or, or different, um, uh, different views of position on a, on a particular issue, is that uh, the public uh, doesn't often understand that. And I think the press hasn't really helped us. 
that science comes across looking like a body of understanding. And you mentioned Steve Schneider and others who've tried to emphasize uh, estimates, uncertainty, and risk analysis. That's very hard to convey, and I think it often gets glossed over by the press. And you know, I've been in discussions with you when you've said, well, you don't want to hear, well, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. From a scientist, you want a nice, clear message. So I think communicating science to the public continues to be a problem. Stefan, you, uh, you talked about, <clears throat> you mentioned more than once conservative governments in, in Germany. And coming back to Stephen's question earlier, if there's something we could figure out how to get from Europe over here, it would be the notion that being a politically conservative doesn't mean denying science or doesn't mean denying that climate could be changing at the hand of humankind. And I'd like to hear <clears throat> any senses you might have as to why this doesn't seem to be a political conservative versus liberal issue in, in, uh, in much of Europe, whereas here it's become very starkly uh, demarcated. And, and Mike, um, <clears throat> I hope uh, you come from away from a gathering like this with some bright new ideas. Uh, we certainly need your energy and your cleverness figuring out how to deal uh, with really with par using parity with the absurdity of the situation we're facing right now. Lady sitting next to Peter there. Yes. Um, thank you all. My name is Spring Greeny. I'm a recent <coughs> college graduate, and I'm working in renewable energy here in Boston. Um, I actually wanted to ask about climate as an ethical issue. Um, there was this reference to kids and grandkids. And I think one of the underlying threads of the conversation that's been really interesting is that there's been a bit of the blame game. Oh, is it the corporations? Is it Chevron and Texaco? Or is it the way that the media is functioning and the way that they're um, changing our perceptions? And I'm interested that there's very little discussion of personal accountability. Um, I, I especially noticed that in the Deepwater Horizon case, it was, is it um, the company or is it the government at fault? And there was very little discussion about who are, um, as individual citizens, what, is, what are the demands we're making on these energy companies? And I wonder if you could talk about that um, and why you think the conversation is as such. Yep. Any quick responses, well, any of you? Uh, I've written a lot about the ethical components of the climate challenge on Dot Earth. If you just Google for Revkin dot climate and ethics, you'll find a heap of stuff. There's a whole website now called climateethics.org, which is a Penn State uh, philosopher who's dived into these dangerous waters uh, as a blogger, Donald Brown, and it's well worth exploring. Um, in the conventional media, meaning outside of blogs like Dot Earth, um, these are tough issues. Those issues are hard to get. Uh, to convey in a conventional news story, um, especially because the climate challenge, the, et the, the realities of this problem are that it's not this well-meaning man's in the front rows kids who are most at risk. It's kids yet unborn in Botswana. And that gives this ethical landscape a very tough, it makes it vitally important. Uh, I just did a piece recently on Dot Earth about how the adaptation side of the climate challenge is entirely primal, like everybody adapts to climate. You put on your coat. The mitigation side is entirely about ethics, and, and no one wants to get at that, including politicians, including the press. But, but why is adaptation not about ethics? Oh, well, because, no, it's, it's my no, no, adaptation. My, my southern no, self no, no, is no, coming out. It, oh, my <laughs> personal adaptation is primal, primal. Uh, you know, making sure our furnace is going to work this winter. Um, my concerns about uh, the two billion people on the planet living on firewood, cooking on firewood and dung, and their vulnerability to these issues is, is where you get in, you're right, get into the ethical questions. But there, too, it's like this yeah. distance thing, temporal questions, it's a huge issue yeah. and, I, and hard to write about. I, I, I have been arguing I think this climate debate is going to change around this adaptation issue. Once we really figure out what adaptation is, A, we figured out we'll have to adapt. And as soon as that happens, a whole host of things change. One of which, for example, is that it's no longer just an energy issue. Uh, it remains an energy issue, but it becomes a whole lot of other issues. For example, water issues. Uh, a, a lot of the, the, the impacts, if you think about them, are all about water. It's about uh, water rising, sea level rise. It's about water melting glaciers. It's about uh, water disappearing, drought. It's about water falling from the sky like no one's business, extreme events. Uh, but it's also about uh, no longer about carbon. As soon as you get into adaptation, it's not carbon policy. It's not, it, it's not carbon management. It's about development. So, so you, you're exactly on the on the right. Uh, I, I, I that was a very long way of saying I agree. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, I want to comment on that question of the credibility of climate scientists and the credibility of the climate skeptics, because I, I think there is a, indeed um, a, an asymmetry here in that as climate scientists, we are um, more and more confronted by kind of uh, a sense of suspicion against us. Uh, there was a weird example, a very simple example, was a paper that I published with Jim Hansen and a number of other colleagues in science in 2007, where we did nothing but compare the past IPCC projections with actual measurements. So there was nothing controversial about that, um, nothing you could possibly really do wrong with that. It was simple data. And uh, the reporting about that was somehow, you know, they, the articles, most of them didn't actually report about our results, namely that the temperature projections were spot on, whereas sea level was, had been underestimated. Uh, but rather, they were all about things like, why did we publish this on this day, you know, just when the new IPCC report comes out, um, as if there was some kind of uh, political motivation behind that. Of course, as a scientist writing a paper, I have no control over when this paper appears. We submitted that six months before. And of course, as an editor of science, of course I would publish it. You know, how can a, a journalist wonder whether there's something dodgy about an editor publishing a paper that he's been had, had sitting in his drawer for months just on the day when it's most topical because the new IPCC report comes out? I think every journalist should instinctively understand that, of course, he would do it that way. And then they try and get a critical voice. And of course, in Germany, uh, every journalist knows who to ring up when they want a critical voice about uh, climate science. And uh, sure enough, this uh, colleague who always provides these, he could say nothing other than, well, the latest data are not always the best. Um, that was his criticism. Um, they printed that, you know, a com completely meaningless phrase. But all that seemed somehow the surrounding stuff seemed more interesting rather than the actual fact of what the climate data were showing. And so we are often on the defensive, uh, even with completely simple reporting of measurements, whereas the climate skeptics somehow uh, never get critically asked by the journalists what their evidence is and what their credentials are, etc. And the, the single piece of advice that that I always give journalists or that I think would be the, the greatest improvement is if whenever they uh, quote somebody, they check their credentials and they don't just write, this is one of the most eminent experts on such and such a topic, but they actually go and look at the published papers and the citations that they got. In, in today's world with the internet and uh, publication citation databases, it just takes you five minutes to check whether somebody really is an eminent scientist or whether he's just a self-appointed expert. But if journalists they did very that, no, do no that. one would no one would call Mike. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mike, did you have anything to add? If not, I had a question for you. Uh, go ahead. Well, we still have another one. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, no, yeah. but maybe no, on no, this no, topic. no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we still have this question open, which I find intriguing, um, and I don't have the answer, is why do the kind of conservative Christian Democrats in Europe take such a different uh, position compared to the Republicans over here? Um, I don't know the answer, but I think it's an interesting question, and I, I can observe that within the Christian Democrats in, in Germany, certainly, there are these two uh, Sides there, there is a strong kind of pro-business grouping, which basically just uh, wants to have unfettered uh, business, unfettered by any regulation, etc. But there is also a more Christian tradition. Uh, we have a responsibility for the creation kind of thing. So we have to look after uh, this planet and uh, after the the needs of our children and grandchildren. That is also a very strong tradition there. Um, which holds a lot of sway, really, in the uh, amongst the Christian Democrats, and it's not completely unchallenged. And uh, you could, uh, Chancellor Merkel doesn't have unanimous support for her climate policies within her own party. I think she would actually do more if uh, she could get the party along. There is some resistance there, but it's certainly not the same situation as as in the Republican Party in the United States. I don't know whether you have an opinion on where these differences come from. 
Uh, just briefly, I think the big difference is that the um, American politicians deal with the American attitude landscape that is shaped by the reality that most Americans don't have a clue how cool things are in Europe in terms of transportation or in Asia. How, I, does anyone know that I still trying to remember the number for how few congressmen have passports. It's like an amazing number. And so we, we don't even know that there's a difference in when I say we, I mean, as a culture, we're, we're entirely cut off from the sense of what the norms are for transportation, for efficiency, that kind of thing in other places. I think it's a part of the issue. Mike? Before we, we, we'll then have time for just one last round, but Mike first. You've got to say something smart now. Uh-oh. Um, all right. I'm going to go think for a minute. I'll, okay. I'll be right back. Uh, well, then that's I'll be right back to answer the question. That's I just very have, good. I, I, I actually have a question for you, then, if, if, if you want to think. I, I, I've been meaning to ask no, you No, I had a problem. I really I, I should go think. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. But, but hey, let me at least pose the question while you think. And then okay, you pose the question, then I'll leave and think, and I'll be back. Okay. All right. Here's, we'll do it. We'll do it that way. That's that's a deal. That's okay. A deal. Here's here's my question. In your uh, the, the at least the movie I saw, I don't know how many there are. Where the Yes Men Fix the World. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me that it was as much a, a critique of the media as it was of the power brokers. Because in, in many ways, the people you really are hoaxing are the media. And, and what struck me, for example, was your first, and, and to me, the most powerful story about the Bhopal tragedy, mm -hmm. where the BBC puts you guys on live, and uh, you pose as the spokesman from Dow and announce this huge, big settlement, and, and, and Dow's share goes mm -hmm. down, and so on and so forth. And, and there's this scene there when, when the BBC interviews, uh, I, I guess, Andy. Uh, afterwards, and and this reporter is so different, Andy. By the way, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. This reporter is so angry at having been hoaxed mm -hmm. that you actually had to take a trip to Bhopal. So the 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 reason for this sort of longish question is that in some ways I saw that at least as as much of a critique of the media and how it plays these stories as of these corporate players or the government and so on and so forth. Am I misreading that? Uh Okay. As I promised, I would go away and think, so I'm going to do that, <laughs> okay. and I'm going to come back and answer that question. Okay, and right. meanwhile, we'll take one more round. <laughs> uh, lady at the, in the middle. Well, I'm one of these journalists, Elisabeth von Taden from Germany, Die Zeit. Not even a button. Yep. That's so my name is Elisabeth von Tannen. I'm from Germany, one of these journalists. Um, to my mind, um, the success factor seems to be one of the most convincing arguments in the whole European story, because only 30 years ago, one was considered as one of these greenish, foolish um, people endangering capitalism and the whole welfare story when you came up with low carbon emissions and the supporting of the renewables. Now, since all this stuff has become economically so successful, and since you can be a smart capitalist, middle-sized factory owner, producing renewables and getting them into the market, you look quite differently. The role of the actors and the shaping and the portraits of the actors has changed very much in Europe as well, and this has been because of a law which has been copied 45 times, the Renewable Energy Law, which just helped the market to get transformed. So how could one introduce the success factor in the American climate change story? I mean, nothing is more convincing than being successful. So. How, how to get this thing done, actually. Very good. Thank you. Up front here. Uh, Susan Chamel. Um, I, I see a big problem with the media and it's become so polarized. People just go to where they want to go. You know, you go to what's up with that and uh, Fox News, or you go to Joe Rahm and Dot Earth. Uh, so people are only pulling the news from where they want to pull it from. And for that reason, I see a big need for the mainstream media to bring it back to the people, to make connections whenever they can. And this isn't happening. For instance, Time Magazine, you know, they published the whole article about, the whole cover was about Pakistan and the rest of the world. In the US, they publish an art, the whole book, the whole magazine is about um, schools. So they totally 
obliterate the Pakistan story here in the U.S. Um, Andy, when you brought up the frog story, I thought you were tiptoeing around it too much. Oh, we can't say the frogs are dying because of global warming. We have to cushion it, cushion it, cushion it. I think the story needs to come out that this is probably as a result of global warming. All these storms, the media never touches the fact that it could be this is exactly what is consistent with global warming. This is what we would expect with 4% more water vapor in the air. They never say that. They talk about floods in Pakistan. The, recently, there were floods in Bangladesh. They, the media never touches on the fact this is what is expected with global warming. It's like a big no-no with the meteorologists and the media not to touch on this. And I don't see why. Every time there isn't a story about a catastrophe around the world, the media can't say this is what could be expected as a result of global warming. And in addition to this, when you get into little stories, like there was a story in um, the Boston Globe recently about the expense of Cape Wind. They never say that the fossil fuels are subsidized with billions of dollars of tax depletion allowances. They never say the true cost of fossil fuels is 40,000 new cases of asthma a year. They never factor in the true cost of fossil fuels. And they, <laughs> I just see, and these connections need to be made so the public sees it. The public doesn't understand there's a problem because these connections are never made. They, they, and they'll say some scientists think this is consistent with global warming. They don't say 98% of the world's leading climatologists say this is what will happen with global warming. And if we don't do something about global warming, you know what? I don't think you understand how severe this is. We could lose our food supply and we could be gone. Thank you. Um, my name is Richard Rosen. I'm a theoretical physicist. Um, one of my concerns uh, about science, and I don't, I guess since this is science in the media, we need to ask media people as well as scientists if they have discussed this issue, if they're aware of it, if they're concerned about it. Um, Jim Hansen wrote a nice article a few years ago on the conservatism of scientists. Perhaps some of you <laughs> caught that. And being trained as a scientist myself, I'm quite worried about that, that the scientists themselves will tend to uh, underestimate the size of effects to be cautious, quite consciously, I suspect, often, because they don't want to be proved wrong. I mean, my experience is most scientists, the worst fear is to be proved wrong. Even if you're half right, you, don't, y you want to be all right. And so it's easier to, say, underestimate the levels of sea rise or, or whatever. And so I think it goes both to Stefan, I'd like your response as a scientist as to whether you think that's going on, like Hansen suspected, and whether you see it and are worried about it. And then and Andy also, is that an issue you thought about? Do you try to go and reach out to scientists that maybe have high estimates of impacts even though you might be nervous about reporting it because then people will accuse you of overblowing the story. We'll take the very last question here. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll cut off after that just for reasons of time. Uh, hi, I'm yeah. John Baldeck. I work for the city of Cambridge on our local uh, climate uh, efforts. Um, I, it seems like we focus a lot on um, the debate over the science, whether it's happening, and obviously that, that this has become a very effective uh, wedge for the denialist, but I wonder if the panel thinks that maybe that's the wrong focus for us. Um, I wonder if um, focus, I don't think in this country that, that there's a belief yet or acceptance that um, that a green future will be better. And so I think there's a lot of fear um, here that um, if we were to do the things we need to do to reduce emissions, that that's really going to uh, be negative in terms of you know the American uh, way of life, and so if we focus more on the solutions and the positive uh, benefits of that, whether that would get us past this impasse that we have over the debate over the science. Okay, bunch of questions. Any of you, Andy? Working well, working from the most recent backward. Yeah, the. Um well, that's why I show the graph of public attitudes on renewable energy versus public attitudes on climate. Uh, you're, you're essentially, and this is not that different. In, in England, there have been surveys as well. So at least within England, I'm familiar with data that show that people essentially have uh, strong predispositions that are not changed by new information uh, once you're a, a fossil, once you're a grown up. And um, 
So you're never going to change that dynamic, but you can. They're definitely portraying the success stories that can come with an energy quest or sort of a real push, a sustained initi initiative looking at innovation and, and, and best practices on energy is a, such a no-brainer. And you see so much more commonality and, and uh, accordance, concordance in people's views when you, when you talk energy than you do. Of course, then you build in the whole security issue, oil dependence, not every coal initiative relates to the oil problem, so, so that's a separate thing. But So yes, there's huge potential there. Just quickly on, um, on the urgency factor, which I think is what you're talking about. How do you portray this problem with sufficient urgency to well, mobilize the world? Well, you had your, let's, let's, let's just, let's let, let, let us, we have very limited time. So, I, and I would love to you know, have you weigh in on my blog as well, which is unfortunately not like Joe Rum's blog. Where you know it is a discomfort zone, not a comfort zone. It portrays the real world of complex views, including these people in these buckets of attitudes. But the the bottom line is, you can't. Your vision of the picture is is not the science vision of the picture. With frogs, if you want to pick your icon, there is nuance there and complexity. There's a chytrid fungus that's killing frogs all around the America, the the, the equator. And, and, and it may or may not have a climate component. And what makes that spread? And you can kind of, you could fight for years. The next IPCC report will not clarify any more magically than the last one, that point. So don't, that's not gonna work if your goal is to have a science-based <laughs> sense of urgency built around specific examples. That's why I, on, the dot, on dot Earth, I talk about, look, the real trajectory is we're a species with infinite aspirations. We need to fit that on a finite planet. How does that work? And, and it doesn't work with current norms for energy. You can't get there from here with our current norms for energy. So we need to have sustained aggressive initiatives in this country and everywhere else on energy. And they have to be in, done in ways that translate our, what we do to, to Asia. Because India is going to have 2 billion people in it almost assuredly by 2050, while China's population is already shrinking. So anything you talk about is not a function of American policy unless that American policy relates to what happens in India. So, get, so basically, get real and really focus on how you would do this. And then it, it gets complicated. It's not simple. You're, and you're not by, you can go to the, the loudest place in the world with the biggest amplifier and shout that message and, and there are people who will shout back just as loud. And I'm, I'm not happy about that. And, but I'm trying to reflect that reality. And when I talk about the social issues on my blog, that's my way of reflecting the reality. The climate problem in a big way is in our heads. And so turn inward a little bit and think about how we react and think about your own reactions and think about your neighbor who's probably, you know, has a di maybe a different view. And try to see, and then step back and just say, what would really work here? And then get going and then get busy. Yeah, I, I would like to comment on that question of extreme events because that seems to be, to me, a very interesting issue of science communication. Ever since I've been in this uh, in the field of climate science for 20 years now, every time there is some extreme event, the media ring up in our institute and they ask, is this connected to global warming? And every time they get the same answer, namely that you cannot connect any individual extreme event to global warming. All you can say for certain types of extreme events uh, that they get um, to be more frequent due to global warming. And I think that many people, I have even seen it in a presentation by a colleague, misunderstand that message uh, to mean that this extreme event is not caused by global warming, which of course we also can't say. You know, We can neither say it's caused by global warming, nor can we say it's not caused by global warming. Let's put that in a headline. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I've, I've actually just, I've, I'm working on a paper on this, so I'd, uh, I've done a, a little bit of a review of the literature and uh, some of my own analysis. And I've come to conclude that if you look at the, the last decade, the number of unprecedented extremes, um, like the Russian heat wave in, in this summer, uh, if you work out how much has this increased due to global warming, you you come to a kind of several fold increase. So that certainly more than half of the extremes that we witness uh, in the last decades are likely due to global warming. We, we would have had less than half, probably only a quarter of these unprecedented extremes without that warming trend in there. So um, 
but you're right if you look at this year's extremes hardly any media made a connection with climate change they were just simply reported as pakistan flooding and and what have you all these individual events uh, whereas you know we can't say which ones of uh, which which of these were caused by global warming but probably more than half of them were i just have to say the new york times had a major page one story on this okay. very point and which, said that this is probably global warming incarnate in that very sense that you described. So I wouldn't say there's any uniform way to portray the media's No, responses. that was probably an overstatement. I'm not following all the media, obviously. No, only no, just I know. What I'm just I, uh, defending my yeah, own term. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, th there was this other question uh, there by the physicist um, about uh, scientists' fear of being wrong. Uh, and I think you, you're talking about Jim Henson's scientific reticence article. And... Um, of course, that's true. Scientists are afraid of being wrong because our whole reputation amongst our colleagues hinges on being right, basically. I mean, that's, that, that's what, what we are like. That's what we work like. But that doesn't explain, you know, why is it worse to be uh, wrong on the kind of alarmist side than being wrong in un underestimating things? That, that's not the same question. And what I observe is that many scientists are actually... Uh, quite afraid of being wrong by having overestimated something and they're not so afraid of having kind of uh, underestimated that they call that i was you know a conservative estimate and it's okay to be conservative that very much the attitude within the ipcc in all the discussions you know let's be conservative and that if you're looking at a risk assessment issue that's maybe not the, the way to minimize uh, risk or damage to society by underestimating the issue and being conservative. Um, that's what they don't realize. And I think that um, th this is maybe a little bit mean, but uh, the greatest risk aversion of uh, many scientists is sticking their necks out and possibly being criticized. And also within the IPCC discussions, oftentimes I heard, uh, oh, if we say this, we'll get criticized by the skeptics or the media. Um, so let's be cautious and not make this statement. And I think um, that's the wrong attitude for a scientist. We should be totally independent of uh, fear of whomever might criticize us. We should simply deliver the best and most sober assessment that we can deliver and uh, not care whether it's uh, on the low end or alarmist. You know, I've been on either end. If you look at the IPCC report, um, our study is the lowest one when it comes to climate sensitivity of all the 13 studies cited there. So we are kind of anti-alarmist on that point. Uh, but then I've published some of the highest sea level estimates. And in each time, it's simply because that's what came out of that analysis method and what the data told us. And, uh, and then that's what a scientist is supposed to publish, in, in my opinion. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll make a few comments on the, um, the, I think it's the issue of this thing. Well, I have some optimistic and pessimistic views on, uh, on the issue being in our heads, or the problem being in our heads. Um, on the optimistic side, uh, it seems like that makes it very easily remedied <laughs> um, at the same time is very difficult uh, just as a sort of anecdote one of the situations that we found ourselves in while impersonating people in considerable power was that um, people would sort of believe anything that we said and and that's why we have, we abandoned satire the first time around we were uh, for a number of years impersonating the World Trade Organization and we would go around as part of this sort of loose coalition of anti-globalization -globaliz activists. <clears throat> and uh, we did it a number of times, and uh, posing as the World Trade Organization came up with a sort of Swiftian vision of the world, a sort of nightmare vision, and would present it to an audience, and they would applaud politely and come up and get our business cards. And eventually that got really frustrating and really depressing, and we decided that it was time to um, use that momentary power and authority that we had as the World Trade Organization to announce that we were going to restructure everything. And we were at an uh, accounting conference in Australia, and we announced that we were going to shut the doors of the WTO and reopen with a new framework in mind that was not 
a sort of free market based framework or a business helping business framework, but rather one that uh, looked at the effects of policies on the ground and then adjusted them depending on whether they were hurting people or helping people. But the whole purpose of the organization was refounded on the goals of putting business in the service of people in the environment. Um, when we did that, the, the surprising thing was that everybody in the room was energized. And prior to that, we'd done tons of conferences and people left sort of nodding. They came up for the business cards, but they didn't, they weren't enthusiastic. They didn't pl applaud um, wildly. And most importantly, they didn't get up and form their own breakout working groups to help us figure out what to do, which is what happened at this conference of accountants, which I, I just, we were blown away. It was like they, they said, we know how to, we know how to do this. You know, they're high powered accountants. They were working for like big firms and, uh, and at the luncheon that we had afterward, they sat down and worked out on paper and we went around while they workshopped ideas and, and they thought it was totally doable. It wasn't like, uh, it wasn't impossible. It was, it was easy once the sort of all the trappings, once they got out of their head, out of that space, once they had an authorization to go, to move forward. And so, I mean, I think that we see that there's a lot of progress being made in places where, um, you know, we, where we don't have the idea that it's impossible. So in that regard, I think that it's almost like a, f a switch could be flipped in this country. And the question is how to make that magic happen, you know, how to have that moment where we could have the sort of effort that was applied, you know, for, I mean, Lester Brown and Plan B talks about the sort of war effort, the effort that went into shifting the economy to a war economy um, in the Second World War. And I think that that could happen quite easily if we had changed that thing. So that, I think, from my perspective, that's the maybe an interesting lesson that I, I hope gives me some hope and a reason to keep doing this stuff. That's a great note of hope to end on. There is a switch. It can be, it can be switched. Uh, <laughs> but we need to find creative ways to get to the switch uh, and, 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 and turn it. But there is hope. That's a good, good note to end on. Thank you very much, all three uh, of our panelists.